started. Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, our presenter this afternoon, Monty Taylor, will be presenting No Ops with Ansible and Puppet. Please welcome him. Hello. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk about those things, or I, I might talk about something else uh, because I might ramble off in the middle of a thought somewhere in one of the slides. So, uh, we will either copy, copy this topic or maybe just show you pictures of worst cats. Um, uh, these uh, slides are all, at some point, I probably am supposed to send them to an organizer somewhere who will probably hate me because it'll take me a while to do that. They are already on the web uh, on the GitHubs and they're in HTML, so you can fork them and do with them as you will, um, what because, license? what's that? What license? Um, so, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's entirely possible I may have forgotten to license them, which is ridiculous. Uh, I'll, I, I take bugs. Um, anyway, so sorry, uh, you can contact me at those places um, uh, if you'd like to. Um, what probably would make my employer really happy is if some of these logos on here uh, said HP on them. Um, but I am a, a distinguished technologist at Hewlett Packard, or excuse me, at HP. We're not Hewlett Packard Enterprise yet. Uh, I will not be going to HP Inc. because I don't know anything about printers. Um, so uh, uh, that's a lot of fun. Um, I'm, it's probably most useful to point out that I do a lot of stuff with OpenStack, and I'll talk about that um, a bit. Uh, you'll get sick of hearing that. Um, I do all of those things, uh, so I, I sit on lots of things where I have to be in meetings, uh, which is very exciting. If any of you want to get into the world of management, I, I highly recommend um, not, um, as much as uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I also used to work for MySQL back in the day, and uh, at, at one point in our lives, uh, Stuart Smith and I uh, hacked on this thing called Drizzle, um, which uh, I believe exactly um, Actually, I believe the OpenStack project is the world's largest user of Drizzle in production, as for the longest time our paste bin service was running on top of it. Um, uh, we, we did uninstall that recently, um, but sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, less important. So, um, as I said, I tend to ramble before getting to the point of the talk. So we're going to talk about, um, about all four of these things, amazingly enough, uh, even though I can usually only I can't even get one topic into a 40-minute uh, time slot, uh, so I'm going to do four. Um, <laughs> it will be successful. Um, uh, I, I will attempt to define no ops uh, because uh, we aren't having enough fun uh, defining DevOps. Um, we need to go to no ops. Uh, talk a little bit about cloud applications um, and, and one specific cloud application that we'll use as a uh, as sort of a, an example case to talk about some other things. Uh, and then in the process of that, uh, I will teach you everything you've ever needed to know about both Puppet and Ansible, all in 40 minutes, because that's going to happen. So um, the shortest section of the talk uh, is, is just on, uh, on no ops, which I kind of thought, I did not realize it was a contentious term. Uh, I kind of thought it was just a little funny. Um, apparently, it really pisses a bunch of people off. Um, and I, I'm not really sure why they're all mad at each other. I think it's just because of the type of people who like to be mad at each other all of the time. Um, uh, but uh, essentially, it, it comes to me um, down to something like this, uh, that uh, as developers uh, who like to run code, which is uh, what I and some of my colleagues are, um, you can code and, and let a service deploy and manage and, and scale your code. Is, uh, it wasn't Wikipedia. Wikipedia, I don't think, has a, 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 an article for this yet because it's too hipster. Um, but uh, uh, this was like on whatis.com uh, or, or something like that. Um, but, uh, but to me, it, it, it kind of comes down to this. I, I don't actually want to spend my time doing ops, right? If I'm doing ops, then I've probably done something else wrong. Um, uh, what, I, what I really want to, to be able to do is I want to change the system that I'm responsible for by landing commits into a source code repository. Um, because if, I, if, I, if that's the mechanism by which I apply changes uh, to the system that I'm running, um, then those changes can do wonderful things like go through code review. Uh, it, it turns out running sudo rm-rf slash as root on a machine, um, maybe it's the thing you want to do, but it certainly doesn't go through code review and, and peer review uh, as to whether or not that's the thing, and, and sometimes maybe it should. Um, maybe before you delete all of your files, uh, you should have the opportunity for one of your colleagues to look at you and say, you are in fact uh, a moron, um, and you forgot to type the rest of that command out. Uh, and so. 
Um, uh, those of you who've worked with me know that if you want, uh, it, it's really better for everybody if there's a code review system between a commit that I'm gonna land to run a system uh, and that going live. Um, so this is, this is sort of, uh, in, in a very short um, uh, sense, the, the thing that I want to accomplish. And I'm not going to pretend that uh, we are actually in a state of no ops in the thing that I run, but it is the state towards which I believe we would, we would like to trend. I believe it is impossible to get to the point where there is absolutely no ops. Um, but ultimately, if I, if I have to use my root access on machines to do a task with, with typing in a command, I like to consider that a bug. I have many bugs in my system right now. There are things that, that I have to do that with, but I would, I would like to, over time, consider those to be uh, not things that make me special uh, and things that, that make me kind of a, a really awesome sysadmin that lets me prove my, my metal, but, but really uh, a sense that I haven't fully automated um, things and I haven't fully put in the checks and, and tests that I could, uh, such that I don't have to shell into a machine. Uh, and, and do that. And there's some, there's some community reasons uh, for that as well that I can talk about, or that I will talk about uh, in a few slides. Um, but in, in order to talk about this, one of the things that, um, uh, that allows us to get, or that has made it easier for us to do this, is we're, we're people who run, we work on cloud software. Um, and, uh, and, and in doing that, uh, it, it, there's this idea of, um, of cloud native applications, which is actually an idea that I hate. Um, I think it's a kind of a, a silly idea, but I'm gonna talk about it anyway. Um, and the idea behind this is, is that uh, if you're going to write a newfangled application, right, you're going you're gonna to write it as a cloud native application, um, the, the theory goes is that you're going to have a, you're going to have an ephemeral compute service, right, that doesn't really store any local data or anything like that. You're going to have some services in which you put your data, uh, and you're going to design all of your applications to be resilient uh, via scale out. That's where you're going to get your high availability. It's going to be where you get your things. All the auto scaling is going to happen. You're going to you're going to magically, you know, your your website that shows cat pictures is is just going to magically uh, handle the Super Bowl commercial that you ran because you're crazy and, and you decided that you needed to run a, uh, oh wait, a terrible, uh, so there's this thing in the US uh, called, called that we call football, which is a different sport and has a large, uh, anyway, sorry, um, uh, that's terrible, um, it tends to, to drive traffic uh, if, you, if you put a, a TV commercial on uh, during one of its main events. Um, and in theory, in your, in your, in your magical cloud app world, uh, you shouldn't have to know it about that and it'll just, it'll just work. Um, of, of course, that always happens exactly like that. Um, but one of, the, one of the neat things about this, and if you design your applications in this way, um, is, is that you're, you're getting high availability via scale out, right? Your, your, your individual components of your system may fail. Um, and you're like, okay, well, you know, I lost that slave, but I have 20 others, so who cares? Um, and, and that's nice because in the realm of not wanting to do ops on things, it's really nice if each of the individual components of the system itself was throwaway, right? That way, if one of the systems has a logging error or, you know, because it ran out of disk or something like that, just, just throw it away and just make another one. And, and the system, in fact, if you have written your application in the right way to do that, uh, theoretically your auto-scaling system should be able to just delete the problem node and, and create another one, and you don't have to get a page on your pager, and you don't have to, you know, take every, you don't have to spend one Friday a month not going out drinking because you know you need to be uh, in in ready access to the uh, to the computer terminal to log in to fix problems. The problems just fix themselves because they're they're not really real problems that have to be. Uh, resolved, and you can come back in on Monday, and you'd be like, you know, we lost 30% of our of our database slaves over the weekend. Uh, we should maybe investigate that and see what the the algorithmic problems in our in our thing are. And you can sort of do it leisurely with a cup of coffee, rather than you know panicked because you were supposed to have not been drinking uh, because you're on call, but you really were, and so now it's two in the morning, and you know you just passed out, and your pager went off. Um, so um, it's it's safer uh, really for for sorts of things. Um, and the the theory that that people People, um, the people talk about in here is, is about forgetting long, long-lived systems. Right? All of all of your things are supposed to be scaled out, so there, there's supposed to be no special snowflake servers that are important that sit there and that you care for and that you even update. They just, you know, they just magic. So it's it's all like it's like shared nothing, which uh, Stuart and I used to work on a, on a shared nothing database, which was fantastic. You lose a node and, uh, and and it was great. I will say that there was absolutely nothing auto scale about that shared nothing database. You had to pre-plan all of the memory allocation uh, because it did all of its, it didn't use malloc anywhere in its code base. So you had to like configure it to <laughs> allocate on startup uh, all of the memory buffers going to be. So um, these are the old days before we had all this magical cloud stuff, right? Um, 
So it's, it's fantastic. It's, it's a great thing for, for new applications. Right? If you're writing, somebody gave you a new task and you're like, hey, I've got a cloud. Uh, I'll write a cloud native application and it'll just work and it'll be great. And you probably wrote a cloud foundry something or other or something and you did Bosch something or other and magic happened. Um, fairies and, and rainbows or whatever. Um, one of the things that we've run into in, in our world, um, which is the one I like to call the real world, um, is that we have existing applications. <laughs> um, it's, it's all well and good to think that you can write all of your new applications from scratch, but it turns out that's not reality. Um, uh, reality is, is there's things um, that you have that, uh, that pre-exist. Um, and in the, in the systems that, that uh, the, the, the team I work on is, is responsible for, uh, for writing and running and managing, um, we, we have some of those. That, that uh, team is, is known as OpenSec Infra. Um, it's possibly not the world's most descriptive name, um, and possibly not the world's most unconfusing name if you don't happen to already be in our, in our, in our circle of people. But uh, it's essentially um, the, the team that runs all of the developer infrastructure, tooling, automation, and CI for the OpenStack project. Um, and and that, that may not sound too particularly uh, sexy or exciting, um, uh, but the, the problem with us uh, is we're a victim of our own success, and we have around 2,000 developers at the moment. Um, those developers, uh, oh, sorry, we have 2,000 developers, and we've decided early on that we want to do massive amounts of testing on every single commit that any developer uh, ever pushes up uh, before we let it land on a thing, and, and that system is fully automated. Um, but we do a large amount of, of integration testing on all of, all of the commits that can be produced by 2,000 uh, developers b before we land them. Um, each, of those, each of those tests, each of those integration tests that we run, um, runs on a single-use cloud slave. So we spin up a machine and we run code in it. Um, and when we're done, we delete the cloud, <laughs> the cloud node because what we did is we installed a cloud inside of that cloud node. Um, and uh, that's not particularly a very clean uh, operation. And uninstalling a cloud from inside of your cloud node uh, is uh, not something that we really think we're going to trust because it probably did something with the networking stack inside of the kernel um, or something uh, else or as root just deleted everything. Um, and that's fine. So, uh, so this, is, this is part of our system that is, uh, that is kind of cloud, cloud scale out. Um, for some numbers, uh, in okay, so this is maybe a two-month-old slide, but, but when I wrote this slide originally, uh, we had run uh, 1.7 million uh, test jobs in the six-month period preceding uh, the writing uh, of the slide, um, which, in fact, each one of those had its own uh, its own machine that was created and destroyed uh, just for the purposes of of running that tests. Um, oh no! Why did that? Oh, my gosh! I hit a button and it skipped all of the all of the slides. Ah! Ah! What's going on? <laughs> Open source sucks. <laughs> All right, well, so you're seeing all of these things in a really weird backwards kind of way. Um, so we're going we're gonna to see what the heck just went on there. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, how about, um, let's see, here, maybe, yeah. All right, let's, let's see if I hit the button, if it's going to do this weird thing that it just did, because I have no idea what's going on with that. <laughs> just, it really wanted to show you some Ruby. Um, <laughs> I'm going to blame, I'm going to blame Ruby on that. Uh, hey, look at that. Um, <laughs> this is what was supposed to happen when I hit the space bar. Um, so, uh, uh, so we ran, wait, wasn't that the, anyway, sorry. Uh, so 1.7 million test jobs in the last six, nope, wow, all right. So, sorry, you get to see this again. Um, Wow, that's really, really fascinatingly strange. Um, all right, we'll see if we have to do this every single time I, I need to advance a slide now. <laughs> it's going to be an adventure. <laughs> um, uh, that, produced, uh, that produced 18 terabytes of log data uh, over, that, over that same period of time. Um, and there's a whole other talks, in fact, that we can just talk about just about <laughs> collecting and analyzing that log data. Uh, but I promise I won't bore you uh, with the details of that system um, at this very moment. All right. Next slide, is it going to go to the Ruby DSL slide? Ah, that's exciting. It's just something about that. Oh, I think I know what happened to that slide. Uh, yeah, so there's a bug in my HTML. I'm sorry. Um, uh, so you, you, miss a, you miss a slide. So there's a slide in there that, that apparently wants to tell you about Ruby DSL uh, that's supposed to, to tell you that, that we ran about 15 million uh, tests themselves in the, in the month of December. Um, in any case, uh, I've now lost my entire train of thought because of HTML. Uh, this is the reason HTML and JavaScript are evil. Um, so, uh, so the fun part about this is that all of this infrastructure that we're running um, is itself a, a cloud application. Um, uh, it, it, we, we do not own, uh, for handling any of that stuff, we own absolutely zero computers. 
we, we own some accounts <laughs> that, that, that are, are, are free um, that allow us to spin up as, as many virtual machines as we like to. Um, it's, it's kind of nice when, when a couple of your, your big contributors to your project are, are themselves cloud providers. Uh, it, it makes it really easy to get free cloud accounts. Um, so, uh, so this system that I'm, I'm talking about, uh, and sort of our, our example um, for, for talking about why you would do some of these things, uh, runs as a, as a cloud application across both HP and Rackspace's uh, public clouds. Um, so that's, that's where, it, where it all is. Um, and uh, and this, is a, this is a simplified version of, um, uh, of, of some of the architecture of, of the system. Uh, it shows some of, some of the elements of it. And uh, actually, the last time I showed this picture, um, the screen was much smaller. And I had to apologize that you couldn't read any of the words on it. But these screens are so enormously large uh, that I actually feel like I could have used smaller type, um, which has is, which is gotten more things on there. Um, so we've got a, we've got a bunch of, of different things. And the, 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 the sort of the way that I've, I've drawn it here hopefully shows um, that we've got sort of three different types of things. We've got um, things like this Garrett, uh, the Zool, and, and Node Pool are all are all single machine entities. Uh, they're they're things that are are you know in in some ways uh, single points of failure in, in a system. If if they go down, then then there's a there's a service outage um, issue. Uh, there's other things uh, like these uh, like the, the arrows going south from the uh, from the Garrett box. There are to uh, a field of Git replicas. Um, those are just machines that are that are uh, they're Git replica slaves. Um, same thing with the the eight Jenkins servers that are over there. These are these are sort of mm, uh, older schools. A lot of these are, and I'll I'll talk about the pooling stuff. These things that are sort of repeated boxes are they're scale out, but they're like manual scale out. We add another one when we need to, based on capacity planning and, and whatnot. And it's pretty easy because we have a cloud, so we just edit a couple of files and we run a couple of commands and we get another another thing. Um, but it's not it's not sort of adaptive or or handling um, uh, handling load in that way. And then and then in the middle where where those are sort of cloud looking things that themselves are in a cloud because it's clouds of clouds I guess. Um, uh, that's that's actually where we have uh, a whole bunch of dynamic pool of of machines being torn up and uh, spun up and torn down uh, all the time. And, and those actually are completely adaptive uh, and actually predictive in some ways. And so they'll they'll pre spin up things based on um, based on uh, looking at what the the incoming um, thing is, and, and one of the reasons that I'm pointing this out before I go into the actual uh, sort of puppety Ansible parts of this is that um, in a in a in, this is a, this is a fairly large uh, uh, fairly large system with a fairly large and complicated um, control plane, and and we kind of have all of the things. We have um, this this Garrett guy right there. It's a it's a it's Java application. It it behaves just like all of the great enterprise Java applications that people tell you are very uncloud-like and and that you shouldn't use. Turns out it works really well. It's been running in a VM in a cloud for like three years now, um, and and it and it it does that quite successfully. Um, and and we have that next to some scale-out things, and we have all of those things adjacent to some dynamic things. And so all together, that actually creates a service that that our that our developers, our our users, consume. Um, and so, not all of the pieces of our application actually have to be um, have to be sort of this magical cloud native-y sort of thing. Um, and in fact, to take some of these, we're actually which are pre-existing pieces of software, um, and to rewrite them, re-architect them completely to make them you know cloudish would be a, a, a massive investment in time. Um, and for uh, right now, the fact that they're not operating that way isn't a problem. Um, they're operating just fine. We'll deal with other problems, and, and we'll come to them. And this keeps coming up in my ear, which is weird. Um, I'm apparently not as good at being Steve Jobs as Steve Jobs is. In any case, um, that architecture, as most of the architectures I think that I've ever uh, uh, that I've been involved with, it did not start out that way. Um, we didn't start the project and said, you know, we need like 76 nodes of control plane with a scalable logging service and maybe eight Jenkins masters, and you're going to need to write a, a plugin for Jenkins to help it scale out in that way, and it did not. We had, we had three machines that, that I manually spun up, and the way that they were configured is that I, I logged into them with a, with a password, um, and then <laughs> manually added some stuff. Uh, and, and then we needed a second one, and so I did that again. And, and ultimately, you get to the point where that starts to get annoying. Um, this wasn't very repeatable. There were also, at this point in time, a couple of people who weren't even 
necessarily associated with the admin thing who had permissions to things to, that also had spun up a, an additional machine over here that I didn't have a login to. Like it's, it's the way that you start projects, which is there's some things in some corners, and you have no idea how to recover them if they, uh, if they were to go away, um, and, it's, and it's pretty terrible. Um, and we had a couple of services that were, were outside of, of our control that we were consuming from somebody else that may have been on 100 machines, may have been on one machine, I don't really know, because they're an external service. Um, uh, so that's, that's, sort of, that's sort of step one. That, that doesn't, that's a great starting place because you, you don't want to spend six months planning for your initial, uh, initial stand up of a Jenkins server. Turns out Jenkins is pretty easy to install uh, just, just in and of itself. Um, but, but this doesn't, this stops being fun uh, after a while. After, after you get to the point where, um, where you've added the fifth uh, slave by hand, uh, and then you had to add the, shell, the, the login accounts for five or six different people who needed to be able to do it. And you're like, oh, okay, I've just, I've just typed in 70 different things and I've read this little ad hoc shell script and it doesn't really work fully correctly and I've got to bootstrap it on there. It sucks. Um, so step one in making the system better um, was, to, was to learn what to me at the time was new fangled hipster nonsense uh, called Puppet. Um, uh, and it was extra hipster because it's in Ruby, um, but uh, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a, it was a, it was a new good learning strategy. I'd been doing Linux administration stuff for quite a while. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, at the time, people told me I should use either Puppet or Chef, and I looked at both of them, and uh, I did not make the decision to use Puppet on any real um, basis that was, it was better or worse than, than Chef. Just um, for the record, it was actually because at the time we were a BZR shop, um, and, uh, and Chef was pretty, pretty in the Git uh, bandwagon. You, you used Git to upload things, and I was like, well, but I'm already using BZR for everything else. I don't want to use Git to upload my, my things to the Chef server, so meh. Um, uh, so Puppet <laughs> is how we selected that. Uh, it's a great selection criteria, I assure you. Um, al although possibly a, a weird object lesson in, uh, in how tying a thing to a particular version control system when there's other choices out there is, I don't know, it's, I do the opposite now. So um, Anyway, so step one was Puppet. Uh, if you haven't heard of Puppet, uh, which is possible, uh, it, I go to different places and people have heard of different things, um, Puppet is an open source uh, config management system. Um, it's written in Ruby, uh, so if you like Ruby, that's awesome. If you don't like Ruby, it's less awesome. Um, uh, and, and that's not even necessarily to pick on Ruby, although I do like picking on Ruby. Um, but largely it's a thing that you extend by writing Ruby extensions. So if, you, if you're not good at writing Ruby extensions, then you're going to get yourself into a really weird place. You're like, I, I need it to do something, and I, I'm looking at this weird Ruby code, and I don't know what to do. Um, so uh, so that's, that's either a pro or a con, depending on your particular predilections. Um, one of the really important things about, about Puppet is that it, it models a state. Um, it's, it's supposed to be a declarative description of the state you want a server to be in um, and not the steps that you would take to get the server into that, into that state, right? So you, you do a whole bunch of, of, of declarative stuff um, and, uh, and it, it, it figures out what things it needs to do uh, to do that uh, and you tell it, I want this file to, to be this. It doesn't care what the state of the file is before, it's just going to make a file with that content now. Uh, and so it's, it's very much squash. Um, it, it, really in, in, it really wants to own the entire system. You, you can use it to just manage some stuff, but like, it's really in the business of, of owning your system. That's what it wants to, that's what it wants to do. That's how it's effective at, um, at its job. Um, uh, one, if you haven't gotten the config management religion yet, um, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic next step uh, after a hand uh, installing a couple of things on a couple of machines. Um, one of the best part about it is that it gets you repeatable and consistent machines, um, which once you go from, from four machines to, you know, say 20 machines, uh, <laughs> starts to be uh, really, really important. Um, the other thing that, that's really, uh, that, that we've found exceptionally great about, about it, and I, I mentioned this earlier in the sort of no-op section that I really just want to write commits and put them into in a source code, is that um, it's, it's modeling the, the state of your, of, uh, of your system um, in source code. Um, so you can you can show patches to uh, to your coworkers, to your colleagues, um, and they can say, "Yeah, that's not going to do what you think it's going to do. <laughs> um, that's going to do really bad things." Um, uh, and you can you can then collaborate. Um, this is actually one of the one of the other main things that we got out of this is we have a, we have a large and ever growing community of people, and we would 
we would like for all of them to be able to collaborate with us on on the management of these of these systems, right? It's not just um, I, I don't want to be the special one with with root powers. I, I want or anyone to be able to come in and to be able to offer improvements uh, to the to the system that we're that we're running and to be able to take that uh, the thing the take the things we're doing and, and repeat it somewhere else. Um, in, in that whole sort of uh, collaborative thing. Um, it also means less re repetition for me, uh, as you might have been able to tell from me not even being able to operate a, uh, an HTML presentation. Uh, sometimes I fat finger things or make mistakes or leave out, I believe, uh, uh, closing, um, uh, closing HTML tags. Uh, and so the more I have to manually repeat a task, the, the larger the chances are that I'm going to get it wrong, right? Whereas if I can encode those tasks in, uh, in, in config management, then uh, it's less likely that Puppet is going to apply it incorrectly. Not impossible, um, but less likely. It's more likely to do the same thing uh, over and over again. So uh, the, the, the bulk of our, um, uh, actually this is not entirely true, but the, the entry point to, our, uh, to the puppeting for all of the OpenStack developer infrastructure systems is in that Git repository right there. So you can clone it uh, and you can install all of the things that, that we, all the systems that we run um, uh, for your own. I, Recommend, and I'll, actually, there's a, I was about to tell an anecdote, but I've got a slide on it. Um, and we all, there's also a thing associated with this called PuppetDB that we that we run. That you can go and you can look at the um, you can look at the results of each of the Puppet runs. So if somebody sends us a patch and we land it, um, the result of running Puppet on the server that that was affected to will will get sloughed into this into this PuppetDB system. You can go look and see um, whether it uh, whether it worked or if there was a problem or, or any of those sorts of things. Which is which is kind of cool from an opening up our 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 infrastructure um, uh, sort of, you know, graybeard land to um, uh, to folks, pretty much anybody on the internet. There's there's no barrier to entry, well, other than signing a CLA. But um, other than the CLA, there's no barrier to entry for anybody uh, submitting a patch to us. Um, I would like to get rid of the CLA, but that's a whole other talk. Um, so uh, Ruby DSL, which is the, <laughs> the, the, the slide that it really wanted to show you a couple of minutes ago. Um, so, so Puppet itself is basically a, a, a Ruby DSL, which is, which is kind of neat, and it gives you some things like this. So if you want to make sure that Git is present on your, on your system, which uh, I believe there's very few of our systems that we don't want Git present on, actually, um, uh, you can just write something like this, uh, package Git, ensure present. It's reasonably readable, um, uh, at least that small snippet is, um, and, uh, and that translates itself into, uh, into some Ruby data structures and Ruby happens and more Ruby, Ruby's things, and, um, and, and, and you wind up with Git being installed on, on your system, um, which is, which is kind of neat. Um, there's a problem, though, in the, it being a Ruby DSL is that some of their internal data models leak. Um, and so this is where I pick on Puppet, um, which is really the whole point of everything, uh, is um, uh, this is if you if you want to reuse chunks of your of your Puppet code in, in different places, say on different servers, and match things, and you know do modular programming. I mean, not even not even object oriented, but just some sort of modularity in your in your programming. Um, it it doesn't really understand the idea of an idempotent uh, package declaration. So you might imagine that if in two different places I declare that I would like Git installed, that both of those still have the outcome of Git being installed. So maybe declaring it twice wouldn't blow up the world, but you'd be wrong. Um, <laughs> so, so you need to be really careful to only tell uh, Puppet one time that you want uh, Git installed, which is really fun if you consume somebody else's third party uh, module of Puppet code that you want to stick on your machine because you may not know exactly what this, and without reading all of their stuff, what, what all things they do, and you might have something else that you're installing on there that is actually trying to do the same things. Uh, anyway, blah, 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 leaky extractions, um, maybe, maybe not just exposing your internal data structures through a weird DSL uh, would, be, would be nicer. Um, so there's, a kind of, there's kind of three different ways that you can go about taking your source code repository of Puppet code and applying it onto your, onto your servers. Um, and we've done all of them um, <laughs> at various different points. And we've done all of them thinking that the others were better uh, in, in pretty much all the combinations. Um, so uh, there's, there's, a, there's a command called Puppet Apply, uh, which basically is just a local application of, of the stuff. You have, a, you have a, a directory with Puppet stuff in it, and you say, apply this, you, know, you give it a file, but you say apply this, and it'll just run in the local machine context, and there's no, no network server architectures or anything like that, now, which is fine, because all you do is you know, git check out a, a, a set of puppet code and run it on the machine. It's pretty easy. Uh, and it's a great way to get started. It's very, there's very low overhead to, to doing that. 
uh, you, you really don't need a lot of a lot of other things set up to be able to do some simple public fly commands. Um, you can also run a, a Puppet Master server, uh, which is a Ruby on Rails app, I think. Oh my God, seriously? Um, all right, uh, I, I, I I promised you that I would babble, and that is apparently what I've done. So you can run Puppet as a, as a master and have uh, agent demons running on each of your uh, each of your machines that pull back to the master uh, and and grab things. Uh, uh, and you can also, and this is how we're doing it right now, you can have a Puppet Master um, and you can run a Puppet Agent but in non-demon mode. So you can have some other thing that isn't running the agent as a demon um, start and, and run it in a one-op mode but it's still, it's still cannot contacting back to the to Master for the data that should apply and there's a specific reason uh, why we do that. Um, just as another way of, of picking on, on Puppet, um, uh, you can do things that are great, like say you need to install a bunch of users on your on your machines, right? So I want I want to have a user account on all my machines, and I want Jim to have a user account on all my mach all our machines, and we probably want those things to have uh, SSH keys attached to them. So this is the first part of the Puppet manifest that you need to use to, to do that, um, and then this is the the, the next part, um, and then this is the this is the next part. Um, it's it's not the it's a pretty simple basic task, and I was originally sort of hoping that that using an open source config management system would give me some more basic building blocks uh, from which I could do standard tasks um, without having to do a lot of work, and that that seems to have been a little bit of a boondoggle. Um, also, there's a really fun uh, flaw uh, for any of you that are using it: um, the the SSH authorized key. It's got a great SSH authorized key primitive uh, that allows you to install an authorized key content into the authorized key file of a, of a user. Um, it, it doesn't really have great built-in uh, ability to do anything like rotating keys or updating keys, uh, so you kind of have to manage uh, 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 serial numbers on the ends of, of key IDs and stuff like that so that you can delete old ones and create new ones, because again, they're, they're leaking their internal data abstraction. So I'm going I'm to move on a little bit. So, um, so I mentioned that we're putting all this in Git repositories, and I, I pointed you at a thing on the, on the web where you could go and grab from a Git repository all of our puppet. Um, but again, this is the real world. Many of these servers have, have private keys and, uh, and certs and, and passwords and things like that. Um, and and it's, it's not a good idea to put any of those things in a public Git repository. Uh, I hope that's not in information to anybody, uh, but you really shouldn't put your private keys in, in, your, in your public Git repository. Um, so there's a really cool thing that, that Puppet has called Hira, um, uh, which is a, it's a symbol YAML database. Um, we, we have it, in our case, sitting on the, on the Puppet Master. Um, and what happens is when, when we run the Puppet agent on a machine on which we want to apply some, some, uh, some Puppet, uh, and it calls back to the puppet master. The puppet master actually can then inject some of the secrets from the uh, uh, from the Hira data. So and and then and then pass them along the wire over a thing that's already had a, a, a SSL cert. Um, uh, it's a it's a you know pre-signed cert, so you know that it is the the machine that is asking for it to say hi. I'm reviewed.openstack.org. Please give me the puppet that I want to apply. And when it's passed over the wire, it will have the appropriate secrets. Uh, Encrypted and, and passed and passed into it, which which works pretty well. So we can put things like this snippet in our um, in our public Git repository, which says, "I want you to apply this this class uh, to this server, um, and I want I want you to to pass into this parameter uh, the secret data uh, that has the key of sysadmins." Um, and you might wonder why the list of sysadmins for a server uh, is secret and, and not something you could put into the Git repository. And it turns out that the theory of people being able to reuse our puppet to spin up servers of themselves isn't just a theory. It, it happened actually way quicker than we thought it was going to. Um, and we started getting uh, sysadmin mail um, from the people who just took our puppet and just applied it on their own thing. So I was getting all these mail bounces. And um, unfortunately, the machine was behind a firewall, so I couldn't shell into it because, of course, my SSH keys are also in the puppet thing. But I thought I would shell into it and fix their server for them. Um, but uh, uh, it was on the other side of a firewall. Uh, it would have been nicer if there had been IPv6, but uh, Linus tells us we don't need that. Um, so, uh, oh, I'm sorry, did I say that? Uh, so anyway, so, uh, so that's all well and good, but essentially what all this is is, is uh, a whole bunch of things running on cron jobs uh, or, or as demons checking in every five or ten minutes. Uh, and running, and so when we run Puppet as an agent on the machines, uh, it's Ruby, so it hangs um, inexplicably, um, and uh, and that's not great because the whole point of this is me not having to shell into machines to to hop processes, and so if the thing that is managing all the processes of the machine hangs, uh, it, it kind of sucks for for fixing things. Um, so uh, so so we. 
one of the one of the next things that we that there's, there's sort of two things that we wanted to accomplish. One of them is um, have have a way for us to run and time out uh, a an invocation of the puppet agent. So that if something goes wrong with it, um, we can we can recover in a in a subsequent uh, run that that'll happen. Um, and the other one is we've we've got some things we got we got complicated and and things needed to be able to go into 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 sequences. Um, and so we added a, we added in some Ansible here. Um, so Ansible is an open source system management tool. I didn't call it config management, although it can do that as well. Um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's written in Python. So if you like Python, uh, this is really great. If you like Ruby, this is less great for you. Um, but uh, but you know, such is life. Uh, as opposed to Puppet, which describes a, a, a state and, uh, and then figures out magically what it is that you want to do on the machine, um, Ansible is very explicitly a thing that describes a sequence of steps that you want to perform on, on a thing. It, it is, it is Extremely sequential and extremely extremely linear, um, which it turns out makes it really easy to debug in terms of where did it break? <laughs> well, it broke in step three. Um, it's almost like we've reinvented batch processing uh, from the from the 80s, uh, and I, I think maybe it, it works pretty well. Works over SSH, which is also pretty cool because it turns out SSH is everywhere, um, and SSH is already security audited, uh, except when it breaks, uh, except when OpenSSL has vulnerabilities. Um, but uh, you know, but if OpenSSL has vulnerabilities, every other thing that you're using to do security also has vulnerabilities. So it's, it's pretty good in terms of, of your security um, thing. Um, and one of the things that uh, hopefully this will show a little bit is that it's really good at incremental adoption. Um, I first started using some Ansible commands in our shared infrastructure, uh, and I don't believe that I told anybody on the team that the, the first few times that I tried it, um, because I didn't have to, because I didn't have to install anything or let it take over a machine or whatever. Uh, it's really good at doing ad hoc remote execution. Um, for instance, if you just pip install Ansible, uh, you can run Ansible star dash m shell dash p uptime, and it will run uptime on all of your machines. Um, uh, and how it knows what your machines are, we'll get to in a second. Um, but you can do this, and the only thing you need is a, a SSH, the ability for the account that you're running this is on to SSH into the other machines that you, you happen to have, which means you can start off doing little things with it uh, and then slowly grow, uh, slowly grow over time uh, to where it's taken over um, the world. Um, so it, it also, in addition to having a command line ad hoc uh, execution mode, um, it, has a, it has a YAML syntax. So it's, it's, uh, it's the, the most of the files you're going to stick into your, into your um, uh, Git repositories are going to be, uh, they're just going to be declarative YAML files, which means that it's really easy to test them for validity without actually running the stuff. I may not have mentioned that it is extremely difficult to figure out what Puppet is going to do without actually just running the Puppet, um, which isn't the world's uh, best thing. So this is, uh, this is a, little, um, a little playbook that we've got um, that will go out and uh, clean out a Jenkins workspace of a, of a particular project name uh, on all of our static slaves. Um, I believe I've used this once, but you know, it was kind of neat. I was able to take a, a slightly annoying um, uh, admin task that, that we have had to do a couple of times uh, and encode it into a thing and it just it does the, the right stuff, uh, which is neat. You could also probably do that with a bash script with a for loop, but you know, uh, in this case, YAML, so uh, it's better. Uh, I'm sorry it's not Toml, which is apparently uh, more uh, hipster, um, but uh, Anyway, um, so and you can run that on the command line, Ansible playbook, uh, that dash F10 right there says please uh, fork off 10 processes, so it'll do this in parallel in chunks of 10, um, uh, which, is, which is kind of neat if you want to do things in batched operations uh, and not blow all of your resources at once. Um, and you can pass some extra variables into it um, and stuff, so that's pretty cool. Um, you probably don't just want a whole bunch of ad hoc uh, Ansible commands um, that you type in, uh, because then it would be uh, kind of pointless. It's neat, you can do that from time to time, but ultimately you probably want, you're probably going to wind up collecting a whole bunch of YAML files and sticking them into some directories. So there's some organizational structure. Um, there's essentially four things. Uh, there's more, but like there's, you know, I've already probably over time. So uh, uh, there's there's it breaks down into modules, plays, playbooks, and roles. Modules are um, uh, oh sorry yeah this is the example that we're going to use to talk about those four things. Um, so we're going to use Ansible to run Puppet, which might seem weird, but uh, it's the it's the thing that um, that wound up being really good for us and allowing us to time things out. So um, so a module is is a is basically Python that's like a like an ex it, it, it's like adding a, an extension primitive into into Ansible's 
um, uh, Ansible's YAML syntaxy stuff. So actually, a few slides ago when I showed this guy, um, dash m shell, that's actually just calling the shell module, which is just a Python, you know, a Python thing that implements rem doing remote shell execution on, on hosts. So you can, all of the, the things you execute in, in Ansible are, uh, are just some Python. So this is actually, in a, this is actually the code from the, uh, the, the, uh, Ansible module we wrote to run Puppet on a machine. Um, and you'd think, oh, why don't you just use the shell module if all you're doing is remotely executing Puppet? Well, it turns out that um, uh, Puppet doesn't really have great uh, return codes um, from it, so it's a little bit complicated to run it correctly. Uh, and I, I just like showing that because it's funny. Um, so this is, this is basically all the things you do. You, it's got some helper things, so you can say, I'm going to make a module. Um, and uh, I've got some arguments, right? So uh, this is going to take a timeout and an optional Puppet Master. Um, uh, and then it'll collect those things, uh, and you start doing tasks. In this case, first I'm going to find where the puppet command is, um, and if it doesn't find the puppet command, that's a failure, um, because if you want to run puppet, you need to have puppet installed. Um, it's very hard to run puppet without puppet being installed. Um, uh, next thing you're going to do is you're going to run puppet, and this is the command that you need to do to run puppet successfully uh, and consistently. Um, you, you do, in fact, need all of those things, um, and uh, uh, because if you do their, their simple version of this, which, which collects all of them, it, it leaves out one of them, which is the detailed air exit codes, uh, and then you're, you're unable to determine whether or not you succeeded or failed in running Puppet, which is weird. Um, and a couple of other default things, and I did some, some uh, Python-y uh, stuff for uh, substituting things. Uh, this is the one that I, that I really enjoy. Uh, so I want everyone to enjoy the, 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 the wonderful logic uh, of return codes in Puppet. Um, so luckily, uh, they did get one thing right, uh, and that is if it exits zero, it is success. Thank God. Um, and, and if it exits one, it, it's a failure, but for one of two possible reasons. Um, and the only way you can differentiate amongst those two possible reasons is by parsing the standard out from the, from the command. Now, I would think to myself, maybe that's because they don't know how to return other exit codes other than zero and one, and so the only thing they've got to do is then that. Except that also two, which they return in some cases, is success. Um, uh, except it, it actually successfully applied the changes you asked it to apply. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, yeah, uh, I boggle. Um, and uh, so that's a thing. And then we're running it in the timeout command um, uh, because even though it has a timeout itself, it's a Ruby thing and it hangs. So we actually run it in the context of the timeout uh, command, and then timeout itself, if timeout times it out, uh, that returns 124. So, um, so with all of the, and then by God, if you get something else out, I have no idea what happened. Um, uh, but, uh, and it's just, it's just a failure. So, but you need all of those things um, to be able to, to consistently run it and know whether it succeeded or failed, which in terms of running something in system management land uh, is important to know. Uh, because you might need to alert somebody that something has gone, uh, has gone horribly, horribly wrong. Um, but it's great because we're able to, to take that little chunk of logic and then use it repeatedly. Um, now that we've got that, we can run that in a play. So this is how using that looks. Uh, I've got a little YAML file. Um, I give it a descriptive name, so when it's printing stuff out on the thing, it says I'm running Puppet rather than you know, something that is less descriptive. Um, and because I called that module Puppet uh, here, it's just telling it to run Puppet, and these are the parameters you're going to pass in. So, so once I've written that, it's actually pretty easy to consume in plays, which are then the, single, the, the, the sort of smallest unit of, of operation inside of, inside of Ansible world. Um, after a while, you're going to need to organize your, your plays, because probably on your servers, if you're using Ansible to manage them, um, there's probably more than one thing you want to do unless you're doing the thing that we're doing, which is just a running puppet. Um, but if you're actually using it for, uh, for, for more config manager like things, you, you might want to do uh, uh, more complicated sequences of things. Um, and so this is where roles come into play. Um, you, can take, uh, you can take one or more plays such as that and stick them into a YAML file, and there's a directory structure that's just the directory structure you're going to put something in. Um, and this, uh, by putting that YAML file that I just showed you into a file called main.yaml, um, uh, in a directory structure roles puppet tasks. Uh, this gives you access to a role called puppet. Um, and I apologize that I named my module and my role puppet, but you just have to deal with it. Um, and so then you can put those things together into what's called a playbook. 
um, which you'll see has uh, not just references of things, but also hosts of where to run it. Um, because having a play that does a thing is all well and good, but without telling you where to run it, uh, it's not particularly all that useful. Um, and so what this is doing, and this is actually one of the reasons that we started adding this, is um, in our infrastructure, um, we need to update our Git replicas first, then update our Git master, because otherwise if we're adding a new project uh, and, we, and we start putting things into the master, it will be trying to replicate to our slaves, which will not have the target, uh, the, the target things. So it is, it is important for us to, uh, to apply our, our puppet onto uh, our, our Git replicas first. And if any of them fail, and you'll notice their max fail percentage, you'll see I've got git zero star, so it's going to run it on all of the hosts named git zero something. Um, and, it's, and if any of them fail, it's going to dead stop. It's going to be like, nope, I will not perform any further tasks, which is exactly what we want, um, because we don't want it to do then the next update tasks on, uh, on, the, on the master server, which is our review.opensec.org. Then it'll run that, and then finally it's going to run everywhere else because uh, we don't really care and they can just do everything, except for AFS servers because they're slightly different. Um, uh, and so we'll do this, and we can just run this over and over again. Um, and you notice that each of the invocations of that, of that role that we made uh, are, are kind of the same. So on those hosts, you're going to apply these roles. Um, and it's, it's not the world's uh, most unintelligible thing, uh, and uh, it, it works kind of like you want it to. Um, so I've, I've showed a couple times where there's like stars or something like that, or some sort of pattern matching on where you want to run it. Uh, Ansible keeps what it calls an inventory, which is uh, its way of knowing what servers you have uh, so that it can know what servers it might want to run something on. Um, it doesn't, in fact, just go out and, and uh, recursively query DNS for the entire world and, and then do pattern matching on that, although that would kind of be cool. Um, I guess you could write that. Um, it would be very strange. Uh, so it's, it's a list of that, uh, and, and also uh, actually some variables and some groupings and things like that. The very simple version of this is to put a, and there's a bug in that slide, uh, is to put a, a, a simple uh, quasi-ini format file into a file called Etsy Ansible Hosts. Um, uh, and you can also, instead of having a simple declarative file, you can, you can instead have a, a, a dynamic executable that will return JSON. Uh, and, uh, and instead of reading the file, it will execute that, uh, that thing that you've configured it to do, and I'll show both of those uh, if I can manage to do that in like a couple more minutes. Um, so this is a simple version. So this is just a file, and it's just got a list of the servers in it. Um, and then also, we've made a couple of groups here. So I could say to Ansible, if I had this inventory file in Etsy Ansible hosts, uh, hey, Ansible, run on, on Git, right? And then that would, that would run on everything in this little Git section uh, down there at the bottom, which gives you a, a pretty simple uh, way to, to organize your things. Um, it doesn't have to be exclusive. Um, so you'll, you'll see I've got a couple of these servers listed twice. Uh, it's smart enough to, to know that you might want to group things in different ways. So that's fine. It's, it's fine with that. Um, uh, for us, we, we, have, we have a slightly more dynamic system, so, uh, and we have all this Puppet stuff going around, which also already has uh, pre-signed certs for each of the systems that we've got. Uh, so we wrote a dynamic uh, Puppet inventory, or a, a, a dynamic Ansible inventory that gets the list of uh, servers from the, uh, from the Puppet list itself. Because if we're using Ansible to run Puppet, then we probably don't want to run Ansible on any hosts that Puppet doesn't know about, because that would be silly. Uh, so we just ask Puppet, hey Puppet, what hosts do you know about? Uh, and it tells us, and then we run, uh, we run things there. Uh, and this is, in fact, the entirety of the dynamic inventory uh, to tell Ansible about all of our Puppet hosts. Uh, that there, there, is, there might be a copyright header at the top of that, but there's, there's no omitted code there. Um, uh, and it's, it's pretty easy. Um, uh, the, the third thing, and this is what I've been hacking on recently, is, is using Ansible for cloud management. I may have mentioned that we're running all of these things in a cloud. Um, that, and Ansible is a thing that can run sequences of steps. So if I want a, a new, uh, say, Git server, uh, describing that in a, in a YAML file in my Git repository becomes very easy um, because Ansible can just take care of that for me, um, uh, which is kind of neat because Ansible modules are just Python. So I can have them do anything that Python does. So if I've got steps that I run on a particular place, uh, there's a list of steps, and it can just provision servers. Uh, so that's actually infrastructure as code for real. Um, I, I actually land a, code, a, a, a commit in a Git repository, uh, and I get a new server out of it. Um, uh, and so if you had something like this, uh, you can imagine that what this might do is tell, uh, this might be input data into telling Ansible that you would like a machine called pypy.dfw.openzag.org in the Rackspace cloud in the region, the DFW region, running Ubuntu with a volume attached to it, and another one in the HP cloud in region BGO1. Um, and then, uh, 
some, uh, we can reorganize it, but I'm out of time, so I won't talk about that. Uh, these are the steps that you have to take to launch a node in a cloud. Uh, for those of you who haven't done uh, the loveliness of launching a simple server that's going to run Ubuntu, uh, it takes pretty much all these steps. Um, uh, but but this, is a, this is Ansible is a thing that allows you to encode the steps that you need to do to perform a task, uh, and it's pretty good at that. Uh, so you can wind up with things like this, where each of those steps is, I need to launch the node, I need to create the volumes, I need to attach the volumes, uh, I need to uh, wait for SSH to work, because it turns out that once the cloud tells you a server is ready, it's not actually ready, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I can add SSH hosts, uh, I can add public IPs to the thing, because if, you know, I didn't, um, that's, that's not so great. And then at that point, I don't have to ask Puppet about the, the, the host that it has. I can just ask uh, the cloud itself for the inventory, because I probably don't have any machines that aren't already in the cloud if all of my machines are in the cloud. So I can just ask the cloud, and that gives me the opportunity to say uh, cloud more often. Um, and, so, and this is an example of the, the Ansible inventory that's coming out of uh, the cloud metadata. So it tells me I've got a server called pypy.dfw.openstack.org, and all of this information uh, that the cloud knows about that server uh, that I can then use to, to do things like, uh, hey, it's got this device and I might want to format and mount that on the, on the server, which is a thing that uh, sometimes you want to do if you've made a, a volume for a server. Um, and at that point, I'm actually over time uh, into the question answering section. So I'm not going to tell you about secrets. Uh, what's that? It's a secret. <laughs> secrets are about secrets. Are there, are there any questions that anybody has? So I'm... Um Yes. Very sorry, but unfortunately, we're oh. running very close to the opening ceremony, ah. so we'll have time even for maybe that. two questions. Oh, two questions. Stops. Excellent. Just two. So who'd like to ask a question? Okay, one, two. Sorry, closing ceremony, not opening. Closing ceremonies. So, uh, hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, on a couple slides, you were talking about running masterless Puppet, and then you were saying there's no need for Puppet Master afterwards. Is that something that you do, or something that you would advocate doing? It's, it's, a, it's a thing, it's a place that I would like to get to, um, because the Puppet Master itself is a scaling point. Um, so uh, it, it, is a, it is a server that's serving out uh, data to all the things, and so if you went, say, from 75 nodes to, say, 750 nodes, um, you start to hit scaling things, and that's actually, you know, I, and I don't mean this to be too entirely snarky, but that's a little bit of the Puppet Lab's business model is to sell you a Puppet Master that, that scales better. Um, and I imagine that I could figure out how to scale the Ruby application server better myself, but uh, I'd rather just make that easier and have there be less of a piece that's sort of essential and that could fall over and, and die like that. So, um, so I, would, I would like to, we're not to the point where that is viable for us yet, but I would like to get to that point. Yeah. So just one more question. Um, I'm not quite following why you use both Ansible and Puppet. Yes. Why not just put everything in one or the other? So that's uh, that's that's that slide that I didn't get to. Um, so I I think that's possibly a nice thing. The thing that I'm really liking. So right now, what I don't have, what you can't do with Puppet is is sequencing. I can't say run Puppet on this machine, then run it on this machine. It's just not it's not how it's designed. And in most cases, it's sort of an eventual, eventual consistency kind of, it'll run places and eventually you'll get to the thing. And for the most part, that works well. Um, in our case, once you get into slightly more complicated topologies you, where you might need to do some sequencing and how you're rolling things out, that starts to become untenable. Um, so because Ansible is actually very good at controlling sequencing of operations, um, and we can do that without replacing the giant amount of Puppet that we've already got. It's a way for us to supplement and, and sort of do a stepwise approach to, to introducing this technology. It is possible, one can conceive in the future that after we've got enough of it in and we're happy with it, that, that a decision could be made to, to move fully to have Ansible do the things that Puppet is doing, because Ansible is totally capable of doing all of those things. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's, actually, it's actually a pragmatic one. It's, it's, we have a ton of Puppet already. There's a thing that, we, that Puppet doesn't do that, we, that we're accomplishing with Ansible. And actually, I think that's, that's a really great uh, check mark in, in Ansible's book, is that in order to take advantage of that feature, we didn't have to throw out all of the, all of the, the, the work that we'd already put into our, our Puppet infrastructure uh, to be able to start taking advantage of that. It also may be that we, we, you know, that we get to the point where we're like, you know, we're happy with the amount of Puppet that's running, we're happy with the amount of Ansible that's running, and it's not worth it for us to do the, the translation work that it, that it would be to, to replace it. So, um, so far it's, it's, it's working out fairly well as far as that goes. Um, but it certainly could, 
uh, from a from a clean system perspective, uh, imagining one system rather than two clearly is is less moving parts. Okay, um, everyone, please thank Monty for his presentation. <laughs> thank you.